Scott's The Celtic Podcast. Kimraha Holodunya, how is everyone? On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gaelic, that's Let's Try Little Gaelic. Lesson one of my beginner's Gaelic course in Celtic history was King Arthur or Scott. And in everyday Celtic ways, the Scottish Wish Trials. In Celtic music, we'll have Julie Fallis, Monron, Greybuck, Dougie McLean, and Alison Helzer. And as always, it's a wee bit of Irish trivia to start us off. In Ireland, what is the national stud? Big hint, it's not me. Check out the E. Old Scott Facebook group where you can be a part of the Celtic culture. And keep an eye out for all the different videos our YouTube channel and Facebook group have to offer. Karish Maha, let's kick this thing off. Welcome to Learn a Gaelic Song by Yield Scott, the Celtic Podcast. Today's song is Cattle Kirak Molur by Julie Fallis. Alright, remember that the Gaelic is at the top of the screen and the English is at the bottom. So get ready and enjoy. Scottish Gaelic is native to the Gales of Scotland. 
Scottish Gaelic developed out of the Old Irish, and learning this beautiful language can be a direct link to your Gaelic ancestors. Follow along in Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, and like I said, let's try a little Gaelic. Falchagu ye old Scots, the beginner's Gaelic course. Kimraha Huladunya, how is everyone? Looky there, you already know how to say welcome to and how is everyone. Alright, in the next 25 lessons um, of Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, that's Let's Try a Little Gaelic, um, with a little work you can gain a rudimentary understanding of the Scottish Gaelic language. Now, these lessons were taken from my weekly podcast beginning back on May 15th of 2020. So if you like, you can listen to them or there as well. But please remember that I am not an authority on the Gaelic language. I just love learning it. I struggle like most all learners. And so what I teach comes right from well-respected Gaelic teachers. I hope you find it interesting, informative, and fun. And as always, I display on the screen what I'm discussing so you can follow along. All right, Kersh Maha, which means, all right then, let's get started. So, lesson one. Now, lesson one is just some simple phrases to get you started. Whenever anybody's beginning a, la a language, they want to be able to say certain things right off the bat. And it's helpful, too. And it makes you feel like you're, you're already into the language. So, today is going to be pretty quick and simple. The first one is, Kimra Hashif. How are you? That's a standard greeting. And of course the reply would be, Hamigama, Tapalev. I'm well, thank you. And, you know, a lot of people, they'll say, I'm well, thank you, um, even when they're not well. <laughs> but um, the reply to that, of course, is Kimra Hashiv Haim, which is, how are you yourself? And then your, your uh, conversation would grow from there. You'd say, Kimra Hashiv and Jew, how are you today? Maybe you knew somebody was sick, and and uh, but you saw them out at the shop or something. You could say, Kimra Hashif and Jew, how are you today? Well, just another standard greeting here is Matin Va, good morning. But what if it's not morning? So it'd be Feskerma, which is the good evening or good afternoon. And then of course there's Oichiva which is good night. Okay, you've got Haibria, which is either she is beautiful or it's beautiful. You've got Hai Allen, which is it's lovely or gorgeous, or she is lovely or gorgeous. Of course, you've seen Tapalev already. Thank you. The answer to that would be Shedavaha, you're welcome. Or it is your life, literally. Masadahole, which is please. Morning Tang, many thanks. Is Misha Eileen, which is my name is Alan. My name is, is Misha Jeff. Is Misha Debbie. My name is Debbie. But if you don't know their name, you say Jay and Tanamahorst. What is your name? Just, if you uh, want to tell your significant other, you know, some sweet things, you can always say, Hagol Akam Orscht, I love you. Or, if you don't want to say them, Martian leave in Drazda, bye for now. <laughs> the, if you strike up a, a conversation with somebody in a bar and you each get a pint and you click glasses, you say, Slanchava, which is cheers. And then when you spill beer all over everybody, you say, I'm do look, I'm sorry. And they say, Why did you do that? Honey, let's sack them. I don't know.
History brings you the tales of the land, castles, warriors, heroes, legends, and customs that have created the rich, vibrant, and sometimes strange and wonderful history of the Celtic world. Winston Churchill said of King Arthur, We find ourselves in the presence of a theme as well founded, as inspired, as an inalienable from the inheritance of mankind as the Odyssey or the Old Testament. It is all true, or ought to be true, and more and better besides. And wherever men are fighting against barbarism, tyranny, and massacre for freedom, law, and honor, let them remember that the fame of their deeds even though they themselves be exterminated, may perhaps be celebrated as long as the world rolls round. Let us declare that King Arthur and his noble knights, hoarding the sacred flame of Christianity and the theme of a world order, slaughtered innumerable hosts of foul barbarians and set decent folk an example for all time.
<laughs> I don't do much of a Winston Churchill impersonation, but the foul barbarians that he was speaking to, what he's referring to, were the Anglo-Saxons, yep. who actually, ironically, became the English. It is believed he came to power in the vacuum left by the retreat of the Romans after the fall of Rome and the collapse of the great Roman Empire. One of the few things we actually know about the legendary King Arthur, based on scraps of historical evidence, is that he was a Celtic leader of Britain when he was still a, when it was still a Celtic land. Now Arthur was a staunch Christian and he is said to have fought 12 battles throughout Britain around the year 500 AD. He became a, a hero to the local people by taking a stand against the pagan Saxons and other Germanic tribes trying to invade the island. Now Arthur eventually died in battle against them, yet the resistance of other Celts followed his death and denied much of Celtic Britain to the invaders for over 50 years and most of Wales and Cornwall for centuries. The legend of King Arthur that we see from Hollywood is a romantic, manufactured version of the truth. The only reason we know of him today is because his exploits happened at a time when Britain really needed a hero. The legend of Arthur developed in the Middle Ages largely through the popularity of Historia Regum Britannia, a 12th century text written by Geoffrey M. Monmouth. Then Celtic storytellers created the Arthur legend much like that of the Irish heroic sagas. They established him as a supremely valorous Christian knight and embellished his mounted warriors so that the country would have an ideal to live up to. Over the years since English, German, and French writers added to the story, yet in every aspect, Arthur resembles the classical Celtic warrior hero who had been idolized throughout Europe and Celtic society for centuries in the past, and imitated by others since. Now, but recent discoveries in a new book by Adam Ardry claims that Arthur was actually Arthur McAidan, the 6th century son of an ancient king of Scotland. So was the fabled King Arthur a Scottish pre-Christian warlord whose remains are buried on Iona? Hmm, who knows? Arthur Adam Ardry claims that instead of the romantic English king of legend who lived at Camelot, which is often said to be uh, Tintagel in Cornwall or in Wales, Arthur was actually Arthur McAid, the 6th century son of a Scottish king whose Camelot was a marsh in Argyle. He also suggests that Arthur pulled the sword Excalibur from a stone at Duned near Kilmartin, died near Falkirk, and was buried on the Hebridean island of Iona, which he declares to be the fabled Avalon. Ardry is an amateur historian who works as an advocate in Edinburgh and previously wrote a book claiming Merlin the wizard was actually a politician. Uh, who lived in the Patrick area of Glasgow. Spent years investigating his theories and says that they can all be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the assertions in his book, Finding Arthur, the true origins of the once and future king, are strengthened by the discovery in 2011 of what some experts believe is King Arthur's round table in the grounds of Stirling Castle. Now, it was believed that Arthur's round table may have been unearthed by Glasgow University archaeologists investigating the King's Knot in the grounds of Stirling Castle. Archaeologists from Glasgow University working with the Stirling Local History Society and Stirling Field and Archaeological Society have conducted the first ever thorough study of the area in an attempt to shed some light on its fascinating history. The find shows that the present mound was created on a much older site and throws new light on a tradition that King Arthur's Round Table was located in this vicinity. There are numerous stories throughout history about the legendary round table that have been passed on for generations about this area, and there are also a number of writings depicting the round table in particular. A few examples, uh, uh, 1375 Scottish poet John Barber said that the round table was south of Stirling Castle, and in 1478 William of Worcester told how King Arthur kept the round table at Stirling Castle. Wow. Now, but something troubling about the uh, established Arthur legend is that the legendary Arthur is said to be buried in an island in the western seas called Avalon. But in the south of Britain, in the western seas, off the coast of Britain, there are no islands. Off the uh, west coast of Scotland, though, there is. Scotland fits all the criteria of the legend. 
It's an island where hundreds of kings were buried. Some say 128, maybe even more. And other members of Arthur McAden's family are buried there too. Now Ardry states that Camelot is a nondescript marshy area north of Dunnet, an ancient hill fort in Argyle. And that's where the sword and the stone took place. Now he believes that the number of connections between Argyle and Arthur are so numerous that it definitely merits a large scale archaeological investigation. But will Britain let go of their tie to the fabled king? Well, he also believes Arthur's 12 battles were fought on different sites across Scotland, not England, and they include Stowe and the Borders, where he says the Battle of uh, Gwynion took place, and the Battle of the City of the Lesions, which he says was fought on the site of the Roman fort of Trimontium in Melrose. Now, he tested his hypothesis for Arthur's 12 battles, and in the list of battles, he was able to identify all of them geographically, as well as historically place them in context. Six of them are even in a straight line. He also asserts that the Battle of Camlan, spelled C-A-M-L-A-N-N, you'll find out in a minute why that matters, in which King Arthur was believed to have been killed, was fought at Camelon, C-A-M-E-L-O-N, near Falkirk, just 12 miles south of Stirling and the Round Table. Camelon, Camelon, almost identical spelling. But what do you say, that's not enough evidence? Well, many other historians have attempted to link Arthur and Cornwall with Tintagel Castle on the same type of evidence. In 1998, an ancient stone bearing a 6th century inscription similar to the name Arthur was unearthed at the castle. But the findings, just a piece of slate inscribed with the name Artogonov, A-R-T-O-G-N-O-V, Latin for the English name Arthna. Now, this, despite all this archaeological evidence, most of the world still thinks of King Arthur as an English king. Although, a last assertion from his book claims that the legend of King Arthur became the victim of an English establishment conspiracy, which was determined to recast him as an English Christian hero in order to tie themselves to a popular legend that gives itself prominence with Christians through the Christian side of the story and prominence with pagans through the Druidic or Merlin side of the story, along with, of course, Wales, because it has such, Wales has such a connection with the Druids.
Everyday Celtic Ways brings you the mythology, traditions, and customs that have created a unique and personal culture that still affects those that are Celtic and those that just love the Celtic world. Between 1563 and 1763, Scotland was a country in turmoil, from religious power struggles to outright paranoia. This is what fueled the Scottish witch trials. Now, belief in witchcraft was common during the Middle Ages, but leaders of the Catholic Church were largely skeptical, seeing it as folklore rather than something sinister. Lawyers were only interested in cases where harm was alleged to have taken place in some high-profile political cases have been recorded, including the case of John Stuart, Earl of Mar, for allegedly using sorcery against his brother King James III in 1479. Now, cases like this were rare. However, as Scotland was plunged into turbulence of the early modern era, attitudes began to change. New laws were formed, and uh, Scotland found itself in the grip of several witch trials and even witch hunts. The passing of the Witchcraft Act of 1563 made witchcraft, or even consulting with witches, a capital offense. As a result, it is estimated that 4,000 to 6,000 people were tried for witchcraft, and that more than 1,500 people were executed. Approximately 75% of those who were accused were women. In 1560, the Scottish Parliament made Scotland officially a Protestant country. However, what this legislation did not do was set down what powers the church might be granted with um, in respect to those who disobeyed the tenets of this newfound faith. Indeed, the new church had barely come to terms with its own new powers and the implications for governing its congregation when the fervor about witches began to ramp up. So when the Witchcraft Act was passed, the Scottish Parliament it had immediately deadly consequences. It was a time of great change in Scotland, a time when your religious affiliation could make or break a monarch or send you to your death for no reason at all. Lutheran ideas had reached Scotland in 1525, plunging the nation into the Reformation. Under the watchful eye of John Knox, Scotland eventually became a Protestant country. Knox initially was a follower of Luther, but later adopted the ideology of John Calvin. Now, both Luther and Calvin held the belief that witchcraft was a crime of such serious nature that it merited the death penalty. John Knox played a significant role in drafting the Scottish Witchcraft Act and was influenced by the beliefs of his role models. Now, the question that they were facing um, was what constituted ungodliness. It would soon become apparent that the new regime viewed the world solely in black and white. Zero tolerance for anything unholy. Significantly, the Witchcraft Act did not define what formed an act of witchcraft, nor did it mention the demonic pact initially. Those enforcing the Witchcraft Act were more concerned with putting an end to superstition and a belief in magic Magic was the ritualistic use of an object or words in the form of a spell to achieve a desired outcome. Now, this could be in the form of healing, fortune telling, uh, love potions, finding lost or stolen goods, and protective and good luck charms. It was believed that illness was caused by malign spirits, which could be removed by transferring it to another person or object. Of course, if someone could perform good magic, then the converse had to be also true. Magic could be used to cause harm. Now, their ignorance of the world and their fear of God's wrath and love of a newfound power led them to commit atrocities on a grand scale in the name of God.
Scots wa he, we Wallace bled. Scots wa Bruce has often led. Welcome to your gory bed, art of victory. Now's the day, and now's the hour. See the front, O oh, battle hour. See approach, proud Edward's power, chains and slavery. War will be a traitor name. War can fell a coward's grave. War say base as be a slave. Let him turn and flee. War for Scotland's king and law Freedom's sword will strongly draw Free man stand or free man fall Let him fall Woes and pains by your sons in servile chains. We will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. Lay the proud. Usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe. Liberties in every blow. Let us do our deed. Scots wa he. Wallace bled, Scots one Bruce has often led. Welcome to your gory bed, or to victory. Now's the day, and now. O battle see approach proud Edward's power, chains and slavery. Top 11 Harrison. Now remember to check out my YouTube channel. It's got 
Celtic music, podcasts, Gallic language, Gallic song, Celtic history videos, plus lots more. And my Facebook group where you can give me your inputs and insights on all things Celtic. But before I let you go, the trivia question answer. Nowhere better symbolizes all that is great about Ireland than the beating heart of its thoroughbred industry. The National Irish National Stud and Gardens helps keep horse breeds pure, a unique attraction of outstanding natural beauty that is home to some of the most magnificent horse and, and sumptuous gardens to be found anywhere in the world. Enjoy meeting the horses, exploring the grounds, the playground, and the magical fairy trail. It's fun for everyone. Martian leave in Drasda. Bye for now. But I'm going to let you go with a song. Swift bird.